Welcome to the National Gallery of Australia's annual lecture. I'm speaking today from our Cara Walker exhibition, which opened in August. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the Canberra region, known today as Canberra, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri peoples, and all First Nations people across Australia. We recognise their continuing connection to country and culture and pay our respects to their elders, leaders and artists past, present and emerging. The gallery's annual lecture invites leading thinkers to present ideas in the field of art and art history. Past speakers include curator, writer and artist John Mundine, who worked with the Ramangini artist of central Arnhem Land to create one of Australia's most significant works of art, the Aboriginal Memorial. This year's annual lecture is presented as a conversation between leading African-American artist Kara Walker and Bunjalong Gi Lili journalist Daniel Browning, the host of ABC's The Art Show on Radio National. Together they discuss Kara's practice and how her work resonates globally, working with themes of race, gender and sexuality. The conversation also covers two recent acquisitions which are included in our Kara Walker exhibition. This is the first major exhibition of Cara's work in Australia. Before I hand over to Cara and Daniel, I'd like to thank the Embassy of the United States of America in Australia for supporting this year's annual lecture, which is part of our 40th anniversary program. And thank you to Cara and Daniel for having this important conversation. The gallery's Cara Walker exhibition is on display until the 5th of February, and I hope you all have an opportunity to see it in person. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the National Gallery of Australia's annual lecture. My name is Daniel Browning. I'm the host of The Art Show on ABC RN. I'm also the ABC's editor of Indigenous Radio. So today, the annual lecture is not so much a lecture, it's a conversation between the artist Cara Walker and myself. And over the next hour, we'll explore two acquisitions by the NGA and the first monographic exhibition of her work uh, here in Australia. Project 2, Cara Walker draws upon two decades of practice by one of North America's most influential contemporary artists. The exhibition explores complex narratives of race, gender and sexuality that run through Walker's signature black and white imagery. Now coming to fame in the mid-90s, Walker's internationally recognised for her graphically striking and wryly humorous representations of the racist imagery, systems of power and harrowing stories that accompany colonisation as it emerged in the United States from the time of slavery. I would like to now self-describe. I'm wearing a black leather jacket with a grey hoodie. Um, I'm wearing glasses and uh, olive green pants with black boots. Uh, so Cara, I'd like to invite you to self-describe as briefly or as uh, voluminously as you like. <laughs> I'm Cara Walker. I have short crop salt and pepper hair and I'm wearing a black sleeveless dress. Thanks so much, Cara, and uh, welcome to the NGA Annual Lecture. I've got a conversation with me about a whole, many, a whole range of things. Now, a sweeping question uh, to start with. How would you characterise your work in terms of form and subject matter to a viewer who perhaps isn't familiar with it or hasn't seen your practice evolve over the years? Oh, I've been so coy about describing my work out loud to people over the years. It's, uh, um, it, it is uh, an attempt at using a drawing, cutouts, film, uh, on a range of different practices that kind of stems out of a, an interest in the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are um, as a people, let's say, as a person, <laughs> myself, an African-American woman, uh, in a particular period of time, and how uh, I and we got to be here. Um, mm -hmm. I think that my work draws on um, a lot of pre-existing narratives of identity formation and um, looks at the sort of mythologies and stereotypes within those and searches sometimes vainly for some kernel of truth or understanding or something like that. Yeah, I love this idea that the, the work is doing something. Uh, it's not for play, it's not um, nostalgia, 
it's not any of those things. It's actually, there is, a, there is a sense that you're motivated and driven to do this in order to, I, I guess, undermine or critique or, or expose um, those mythologies you talk about. Right, I guess, and also just understand in a way, like how these, how, I, I guess I'm still being a little bit vague in general right now, but I think as a young artist in particular, trying to understand how systems of power came to kind of affect uh, not just my worldview, but the worldview people had around me and to sort of look at those, those competing dynamics. And because I had a painting practice as, uh, uh, or wanted to begin you know, exploring these topics through a painting practice and I sort of headbutted against uh, a narrative of, or histories of racism within the uh, kind of art historical context. Now, the acquisition by the NGA of these two works uh, is a major coup for the institution. How do you think uh, some of the global questions that your work speaks to, um, and the contemporaneity of them, how do you think it translates uh, in parts of the world where you've exhibited, perhaps, not, perhaps outside of America? I'm interested in how you see your work uh, and the way it's been received over the years. I think it depends on where we're talking. I mean, I think I've never traveled to Australia, but it's a, a country that has part of the colonialist project, the British colonial project. And I think that um, a lot of the countries that are including not, not just America and the Americas, but who are really exploring their relationship to um, post-colonial critique are really invested in the work in a way that's different than different now really than it was in the 90s to be honest because I think that um, when I started out there was a kind of a kind of glib um, misunderstanding that I was talking about something that had to do with uh, a black problem <laughs> um, or an American problem um, but the the way that the work uh, is read I think is a little bit different from place to place I think that the, the, the wrong-headedness sometimes, the humor, the um, tri tripping over different um, tropes and sort of mixing and merging and blending and, you know, kind of exploding power dynamics um, complicates things in a way that might be, I, I imagine can be challenging, but I'm not really sure um, for uh, folks who are really at the cusp of critiquing their relationship to colonialism. I think that my work comes out of a, a, maybe a disillusionment with uh, a certain critique that I was born into in the you know, late 60s and 70s. So. My generation in the States was a kind of part of an experiment um, of uh, desegregation and uh, multiculturalism. And uh, so my experience is really informed by the sort of two-pronged attempt to sort of right the wrongs of history and to discover that the wrongs of history are still very, very present. <laughs> And what I love about your work, and I think the mistake that people make in, when they look at it, is to imagine that these tropes um, exist only in the past. I mean, I think, you make, I think I understand that you make this work because these, these tropes uh, and their after effects, um, and the after effect of institutionalised racism and slavery for many centuries, uh, is constantly playing out. Right. And the trouble with being an artist, in a way, is that uh, the stories, the images, the sort of mythologies that are, that exist, that were created, you know, at the expense of other human beings. And I'm not just talking about fictions, but also um, narratives, narratives written by formerly enslaved people. You know, all of these things join into this big pot of cultural influence, big reservoir of information and feeling. And um, this is like the, 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 the nourishment in a way that an artist can draw from, but the minute you draw from it, 
you know, you start just stirring the pot, like literally. And that's, uh, it's, it's just a, a strange uh, paradoxical problem or even a trap to find oneself in. Um, because yes, I mean, the, the, the actualities of, you know, racism, racist behavior, you know, racist killings, you know, violence um, against black bodies in particular is still very, very real. And because we live in this, the culture that we live in, we are more adept at looking for solutions, solving the problem that is so deeply ingrained in the fabric of the culture. And you kind of have to undo the culture in order to, um, to fix the problem. And there's a lot of people who don't like undoing things. <laughs> You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, trauma that comes in, in breaking apart systems of power. So. Absolutely. And, you know, I guess, the, I guess we have to face the fact though, that the world is implicated in slavery. I mean, just thinking about a grain of sugar and the kind of havoc that wrought on the world. Um, it, um, it, uh, and the inherited wealth of, you know, the ruling classes. Uh, still very much a real thing in places like the UK and I would imagine the US and and you know trying to under, trying to understand and explore uh, the deep um, heritages and lineages of slavery yeah I think it and the the I guess you know where where some of the paradoxical stuff again like talking about like going into this reservoir of information of not just information is the wrong word but this like this wealth of material that um, exists with each one of these power institutions is, um, it, you know, I mean, I feel like part of the project and the problem of my work and maybe the problem of receiving the work is that it kind of exposes us to our culpability in some ways, even as people of color of like, uh, you know, eating some sugar, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, or, or you know, participating in some way, you know, going to Buckingham Palace or whatever, like looking at the, the emblems, even as you're critiquing the emblems of power, you know, sort of being a little bit in awe of like the god awful audacity of it, you know, the, the, the grand eloquent show offiness of it and, you know, and, and what it all represents, and like what bodies are are sort of buried beneath the uh, the statuary, you know, that are that are hidden. Now, you know that wholesale trade in in, in human life uh, that lasted for centuries. The European powers were all uh, participated or benefited directly or indirectly. Now, these I want to talk a little bit more about how how you see the 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 kind of after images or the mirrors or reverberations in daily life uh, for black people in settler colonial states um, and even in the, the mothership of imperialism in the UK, throughout the world in fact. But I want to understand how you, do you navigate that history, that turbulence um, through, through the work? I mean you talk about it as, as an attempt to unpack uh, and explore those, um, those the, the two forces, you know, the multiculturalism and desegregation that you grew up with, this experiment and also the actual legacy of, of, of history itself. Right. I mean, I think that the if I didn't have artwork to do, I don't know exactly what I would do. Um, I think because of the, um, I mean, in a way, it's, I'm going to say complexity, but it, it's very simple on the one hand, you know, that wrong is wrong, but, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think that where, um, where, when it comes to sort of, Thinking about being an artist, for instance, you know, in entering automatically into this kind of, I entered, let's say, automatically into a very Western tradition of art making without really realizing it at the time. Um, so the critiques that are sort of embedded in the, in the, the physical form of my work are also um, reflective of this conflict I have of wanting to be an artist in this Western tradition and not really being able to fully embrace that because of the legacies of uh, exclusion mm. that are present within. 
and the sort of need to kind of navigate this very thorny, murderous terrain wow. with a kind of a an eye towards the you know the beauty of Gauguin, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> and and uh, and a you know and a jaundiced view of the whole enterprise, the whole art making enterprise, you know, and I think giving it up isn't an option. So for me, wow. so um, what's the way? What's the way through? You know, how do we find solutions uh, to the problem of of wanting to to explore? You know, these global histories, artist art histories, you know, personal histories. Um, I mean, for instance, not to sort of get too anecdotal, but I was looking at uh, Ancestry.com, you know, looking at my family tree and trying to find some information. I had participated in a program a little while back that looked uh, deeper into my uh, family's history. So I got more information than I had been able to find on my own, but I wanted to just see if I could get a little bit further because, you know, it's a generation or two and then it's, it's wilderness for, um, for a lot of us, people of color in America, uh, especially when slavery is involved. So um, there's a, a family legacy of a uh, mulatto uh, great-grandfather my, on my mother's side and a lot of sort of speculation about his, um, you know, his parentage. And some of that came to light in the, in the program that I watched. I mean, and that's the thing. It's this, these histories, we can't, if you're a person of colour or a person of, of, of your background or my background as a, an Indigenous uh, Aboriginal man and uh, also the descendant of South Sea Islanders who are forced to work in the, in the cane fields here in Australia, um, you, you can't, it's written in your body. It's, it's, it's impossible to kind of get up and walk away or discard that as much as you may want to. Um, we, we kind of have to we don't have to perform this, but it, it, is, it is part of our lives. Right, and people pick and choose in different ways, right, to yeah, 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 explore, yeah. expose, or deny, or reject. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's, there's very many different ways to, to live this life. I mean, and you've obviously kind of gone on a journey, and as many, as many of us do, trying to understand the past and, and how it um, reverberates in the present. But how have you? How would you characterize that journey? I mean, growing up in that kind of desegregated uh, world that was trying to pretend like it, there was no, there were no differences and everything was flat, and we were all equal. Um, to to now, to where we are now. Well, I think my experience was very um, was very starkly bifurcated by a by a move which I've talked about in the past. But um, my childhood was spent in, on the West Coast here in California, which I think, um, looking back, had a, a kind of a progressive, rosy outlook. So despite the fact that I was bused to a new school, um, many of my friends came from a range of ethnic, ethnic backgrounds, spoke a range of different languages in, the, in their own home, and we all came together as, as friends and as equals in school. And so it really wasn't something that I thought about. Race wasn't something that I thought about until we moved to Georgia, which is sort of the ancestral homeland of my um, parents' families um, down in, in the South. And I think a lot of my thinking around um, race and these issues was informed partly by that move and partly by my ingrained childhood stereotype of what that move would mean, which is to say I had no connection really to the family in the South whatsoever, nor a connection to what it would be like to move there. But I had a deep fear and nightmares about what it meant. And so I think that there's something really, you know, like what, what, what would I have received, you know, on the West Coast about Southern life is the same information that everyone else in the world received about Southern life, um, based on the news, the um, um, 
civil rights campaigns, the Gone with the Wind and sort of Song of the South and sort of mythological narrative of the sunny South with its happy slaves and its colorful Southern bells. Um, this, that kind of uh, schism was present just in culturally, I think it was present for a lot of people. So I already had a, a, an image of what I was entering into before I had set foot in a place that, a mythology, I had already had a mythology of the South before I had entered into an actuality of the South. And um, what, I, what I encountered was a, a very stark black and white division in, you know, in, the, in Atlanta at the time in the early 80s. But I also felt like uh, there were so many limited prospects, you know, like I just felt like I suddenly entered into a, a, a world of reduced prospects as a, as a African-American youth that um, you had to keep to your own and stay protected. And those people who I might have ordinarily considered or counted as among the friend group were suspect and um, and prove themselves sometimes to be <laughs> um, suspect um, and um, dangerous. Um, and that, I think that having a, a worldview, a sunny worldview shattered um, informed my practice. And I think that the other thing that is key, I guess, in the, in the look of my work is retaining the sunny worldview despite it the cartoonish, the jocular, the, you know, puppetry, the, uh, wow. the, the will, willful optimism. And I love that you, you have played, regardless of, of what, whatever criticism you might have received about uh, the, these kind of reiterations of tropes and, uh, and stereotypes, you have continued to, to play with them and to draw out the humour and to pose questions um, that make us think about all kinds of relationships, you know, race, gender, our relationship with history. Yeah. I, I think some, in, in some regards, I'm, I'm also a little bit inspired by, um, um, I, I'm going to get the name wrong, but there's a, um, a Greek and Turkish um, character, trickster character, whose name, my name is part of, Karia Rosis, I think is his name, but I I'm, will have to look him up. He also appears in shadow puppet form very often as a, a trickster figure. And I feel like in the, in, you know, globally, there are uh, oral histories and trickster figures who figure prominently and they sit outside of, within and outside of uh, any given culture. And I, I find that for me, in some ways, these um, caricature figures occupy that space, and, and particularly in American culture. Um, in the late 80s, there was a lot of collecting, a lot of African Americans started collecting these sort of black collectibles. So there was a conversation back then about um, what these stereotypical objects mean, what it means to have them in your home, what it means to uh, take them out of, uh, out of circulation or whatever they happened to mean when they were uh, trafficked among um, mainly white people. And so it, it, it's, it's a curious, it's just a curious thing to wonder why so many, you know, why so many of these figurines were, were necessary, to, uh, you know, uh, minstrel figures and, you know, uh, postcards and cartoons and photographs. And, you know, why was this kind of, recitation of, of uh, uh, brutality so necessary in, in every format, um, if not to, in some way, um, not just undermine the people depicted, but um, provide uh, some kind of psychic outlet for the, the, the dark, unknowns of the ruling class or the or the the darkness they refuse to acknowledge absolutely i mean in their resonances here with um you know contemporary artists who 
accumulate what we call Aboriginalia, these, uh, I guess, racist depictions of, of Aboriginal people, uh, which were, you know, plaster statues, um, ashtrays, um, black velvet paintings. Um, we were always depicted in these, I mean, these are, these, are, these are works of the imagination. Of course, they are underwritten by, you know, racist pathology and white supremacy. Um, but, you know, a lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the Aboriginal artists working with these materials or objects um, kind of have a fondness for them and talk about rescuing them when they find them in junk shops and then recontextualising them. I mean, do you have that kind of relationship with the, the, the kind of tropes that you, you use in your work? Or? I think so. I think I do. When you make an image with a face on it, whatever that thing happens to be, it becomes something. <laughs> you, as a human, cannot help but give life to it. So I think that it, it does become um, important as a kind of, you know, spiritual guide to like look at these oh. things and 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 you know consider consider the object i i think before i was interested in in the sort of racist object i was interested in just those household objects um just as they exist in people's lives because i i did wonder from an early age what what they were meant to do you know oh. like what role were they meant to fulfill and so I, I think mm -hmm. I, I had already been projecting my myself into these, into any kind of random, um, you know, um, mantelpiece objects, mm -hmm. you know, the, their forgotten status and giving them some, something. Now, in terms of the form of your work, I mean, you're you're very hard to kind of, you know, and I, I sense you struggling with that question to characterise your work and its subject matter, subject matter over a very long period. But you know, you obviously started out with the silhouettes and these extraordinary paper cuts, often life size. Your painting, of course, your painting is very very important. Is there, is there one medium which particularly draws you, or do you, do you just latch onto that thing that is the best way to express the idea that you're having at that moment? I think these days it's really about finding the way to express the idea, um, mm. which also means that I wind up going further afield than what I'm actually capable of doing. I think, and I think there's a little <laughs> something to like being unmoored that um, yeah. uh, I both hate and need in my practice. Um, so, so I like untether myself from what's comfortable because it should never be comfortable doing the work. Yeah. And so as a result, I have a hard time enjoying doing my work. But um, I think with the uh, uh, sort of, um, I, I exaggerate, but the um, the gist of it is I, I I I sort of abandoned strict painting as a as a student and found a way f to make the make meaning I guess make these problems that I was trying to wrestle with um, make sense through the cutouts and. Um, and the only reason that I speak about the cutouts in the past tense, not that I'm really done with it, is that I had such a, uh, a reckoning with being known as the silhouette artist. And I, uh. I think it's a little bit the refusal to have the reception or the idea around what this work is um, lose its impact or something or become decorative. You know, it was, it was decorative against decoration. Um, initially, so I think that um, trying to find ways to to make yeah again to make meaning, but it keeps pushing me into other modes. I, I the first uh, moment actually was the, uh, the the piece testimony that that the museum acquired, um, just because I knew that I a lateral transition to moving images, moving um, shadow puppetry made the most sense, but it took me a, a, a couple of beats before I knew how to, to just jump into it and do it as, as quickly and as rudimentary as possible because I think it, it just had to be done, you know, like I just have to do it. Look, I really love that work and, you know, it, I laugh out loud. Um, I'm stirred by it. Um, I'm provoked and it makes me think much more deeply about 
uh, you know, power relationships uh, on very many levels, not just historically. It, it's also, as I say, the reverberations are with us today. They're, they're in the present. They're in our interpersonal relationships, um, and they're contemporaneous. But I, that, that move to shadow play and turning and animating those cutouts, it, it was it was an obvious move, I suppose. It, it had, but you had never. I mean, in the way silhouettes work, they, they don't have to move. Uh, they don't have to be shadow play. Yeah. They could be. I mean, I, I think initially, you know, I was doing a lot of reading and, you know, sort of research on, on the, that format. And so it made, um, you know, I was kept running across like Lotte Reiniger and other sort of uh, uh, silhouette uh, cutters who made animations. And I thought, well, of course I, I could and I should and I might, but... Um, the only thing that was really holding me back was having this painting practice that didn't, I never explored, I never picked up a camera, you know, <laughs> like that was really the, the gist of it. Did you, did you make another film where you kind of employed the shot, where you animated the, 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 the cutouts? Yeah, that, the testimony was really the first one. And then um, each successive one, I tried to get a little bit more technically advanced, um, very slightly. So the <laughs> second uh, yeah. film I made a couple of years later was... Uh, Eight Possible Beginnings or the History mm -hmm. of African America. Um, and that was kind of like a shadow play in eight acts or something like that, um, loosely uh, based around Walt Disney's Song of the South uh, slash the Uncle Remus tales that Joel, Joel Chandler Harris wrote and that kind of um, storyteller, the, the, the idea of becoming a storyteller, I guess, or the idea of myself being a storyteller. So I sort of, and I, I guess I am present in all of these films to some extent, you know, because my hands are, you know, in the frame, my face is in the frame. There's, there's sort of no hiding because it is again about this power dynamic. So, you know, who is, uh, who is the master yeah. here? Who is the, who is being made to do my bidding? Um, mm. And yeah, just to kind of acknowledge that, I guess, to sh or to show that up as one of the problematics. In in one way, we all we are all under pressure to be something if we're not um, from the dominant dominant culture or the dominant class. Uh, there are always projections uh, that we are subject to, no matter how we try to free ourselves of, of those. And the art, an artist, I guess, I guess, get uh, get. Uh, short shrift they get they get projected onto as well not nearly um, as damaging though I guess is those some of those kind of racist constructions of identity how, how how free do you think how freeing has your art been for you personally in trying to um, just be a human being living in the world that isn't that isn't someone else's projection this is that's a tricky question that's interesting mm, mm. because yeah. It, well, I mean, I, I it's, just it's, it's because I see your work as a, as a navigation through that through that trying to understand how you free oneself from, you know, <laughs> right. you know from all from all these things that constrict you. Right. Well, you can see the comedy of it, right? It's like uh, untangling mm. a sweater and getting tangled up yeah. in the threads. Um, it's a little yeah. bit like that all the time. Uh, not how I don't have the sweater yeah. anymore, <laughs> but I do have all of the strings. Um, I, I I think that it's, on the one hand, absolutely liberating, right? Like to be mm. able to even establish a practice that I, you know, have to entrust myself with to some extent and have, you know, people want to see it. And this is a privilege that I don't really take for granted. Um, I mean, sometimes I do. <laughs> Let's be real. Like sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just You're like, oh, I have to go to the studio, you, you know, like there's a, you know, we, we all complain, but not, um, not too much. And I think that the, the, that reality, you know, it, that I can do my work and answer these questions and have that resonate and, you know, Listen, um, sometimes people show up to my shows who've never been to an art show, and that is important to me. And it's a lot of, I feel like I have to explain even more because it's like, oh, don't look at this first, you know? <laughs> like, there's some, here's some real artists by, you know, 
responsible African-American artists or people of color that you should look at first and then look at all these things. And so I, I kind of feel like uh, a responsibility in that way. But, but that, um, and, and then on the other hand, there's uh, the feeling that I'm often fighting against, um, fighting against type or fighting against stereotype or fighting against um, being reduced to um, being uh, a role model, um, which is a funny thing to fight against because I think it's, it's one of the goals people might have is to, you know, have an, have an effect. But I think that in some way, maybe some of my, uh, I'm just thinking out loud, but I think some of my, um, my ideas of what freedom as an artist looks like, it really includes a kind of freedom from all of those concerns, <laughs> you know, which is really a model that is the Western art historical model that we were talking about earlier that I was trying to, trying to critique, you know. I should just be on my own in the desert, not worrying what people are doing outside of my particular bubble, that it becomes challenging to, to exist like that. I can't do it for long. Now, I'd like to draw out a quote of yours. You said that heroes are not completely pure and villains are not purely evil. I'm interested in the continuity of conflict, the creation of racist narratives or nationalist narratives, or whatever narratives people use to construct a group identity and to keep themselves whole. And we deploy these narratives almost in an unthinking way every single day. What are the stories you think Americans tell themselves to keep themselves whole? as it were. We tell ourselves that we're good people all the time, that we're, we, we're you know, that we're freedom loving people. Mm. <laughs> and, that, and that freedom is a thing that we can really just, you just say the word and we know what that means. And there's no, mm. there's no questioning about what, what, you know, it's such a shorthand term um, that, that kind of means barbecue. I'm not really sure what it means. And I think that, mm -hmm. um, it's it's wonderfully reassuring to to have all the signs and symbols, um, you know, to drape oneself in flags and you know um, parade around, you know, and and stage uh, camera ready insurrections, but it's also um, I just feel like there would be a I kind of feel like I just want all of this country to go to therapy for like a big, a big group therapy. But I also, in a way, feel like we're in it. You mm -hmm. know, like this moment, this last couple of years in particular with, uh, since maybe 2015, after Dylan Roof went on his killing rampage and we started really talking about Confederate memorabilia, Confederate monuments, these kind of relics from, you know, 150 years ago. Like, why are they still, 170 years ago, why are they still present in our... Stalking us in the present, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and I know that people have been talking about them in the past, but they really got uh, a full head of steam, you know, just in the last seven years um, mm. to actually remove these monuments, to really um, question them. And I, I feel like the, that will towards therapy that I <laughs> joke about is um, kind of happening <laughs> in the in the face of and, and it's happening with the kind of chaos and violence that um that i guess is inherent in my work you know i mean i think that the dismantling of of sort of racist ideologies engenders a kind of chaos and um uh. you know the sort of free fall of 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 multiple people's identities, identity formations, and it hasn't, you know, it hasn't, we're not done, mm. you know, where it hasn't settled into some kind of workable format, you know, where we can live together. Yeah, that's part of the contemporaneity of the, this kind of antebellum America that your work often describes. You're not simply representing a vanished world or or, you know, just quoting images that, that, that you want to breathe or resuscitate and put back into, into popular culture. It's not a nostalgia project. And I think people 
perhaps outside of America may not understand the the humour and the, the kind of the wit and sarcasm uh, in the work. So I, I really wanted this this lecture to be a way to to give people a, a kind of a, a cue into understanding what was actually happening here. Uh, it's very subversive. Uh, the, the imagery is entirely subversive and fun and cheeky and critical and it works on very many different levels. I think, yeah, I think the... the, the... <laughs> I think that these days I'm really trying to veer away from bitterness because I think the, 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 the yeah, when the, <laughs> when the scales tip too far in one direction, um, it gets hard to be funny. But um, I guess a lot of comedians face that problem as well. Um, just looking for the, uh, looking for the way up um, from, from what seems sometimes like doom. I'm not to say that it's uh, purely hopeless or anything, you know, that one thing that I can sort of keep doing is trying to make work that kind of holds one's gaze for a while. Um, even if it's to just wonder, what is this about again? Mm. You know, just as a, so it's not so much that it's a nostalgia campaign at all, but there's a, I think that there's a, a kind of a, a way of utilizing what looks to be nostalgia to hold the attention of the of of the viewer who might rather turn away from the unpleasant mm. subject. Now, the caricature of of, of 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 black bodies throughout history in in in, in literary and popular tropes. I'm thinking of Mammy in Gone with the Wind, uh, the Aunt Jemima trope. Um, they're, they're relics in, in many ways, and they figure in your artwork in the silhouettes, but also in a very large, very large sphinx-like sculpture um, made partly from sugar. Uh, it, was, it was a foam structure overlaid with, I think, 40 tonnes of cast sugar. It was a work in an exhibition called The Subtlety or the Marvelous Sugar Baby uh, at the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn in 2014. It was the largest public artwork uh, at, at the time, I think, the largest public artwork ever made or ever erected in New York City. Possibly. I don't know the stats of it. Certainly the mm. largest public artwork I ever made. Um, Give me a sense of the scale. Yeah, the scale, I think it was, a. Uh, it's been a few years now, but I think it was about 33 feet high and mm -hmm, maybe mm. 75 feet long um, in a in a gigantic um, warehouse space that was about to be demolished. Um, so it actually, it was at a scale that was both um, gargantuan when you, when you approached it, but if you entered into the building at the designated spot, you could m easily miss it for a moment just by looking around at the, you know, at the space. What is the space? What is this, you know, terrible smell? You know, it's very pungent. Um, molasses odor left over from from its days as a working sugar plant and uh, and then sort of come upon this piece that was much larger than life was there was there a sense too that you were reaching a new audience or did you, did you get a sense of its kind of enormous potential um, if you hadn't before I mean it, it obviously was seen by very many people because of its kind of sensational quality. Yeah, it was definitely, um, uh, yeah, I knew I was reaching a, a, a larger, different audience. I think I had to think about my work in a different way, somewhat different way. Um, and I think I still wound up feeling true to my own process and project in, in that um, it's very similar to the cut paper pieces in some ways in, in its sort mm -hmm. of impact or affect um, that it sort of collapses multiple histories and narratives into a body, you know, uh, and into, you know, a, well, a single body, and then there were multiple sort of figurine attendants that were more at a, a human scale. Um, it had, you know, the element of kitsch, the uh, sort of element of surprise, you know, it was very physical, it was very physically kind of uh, repulsive and attractive, um, big bosomed, you know, large assed, you know, very sort of present um, labia at the back, uh, on the back end, if you got to the back end, it was, um, 
spectacular. It was unexpected, I guess. Um, it raised a lot of uh, hackles, but I think a lot of questions also around sugar and um, our ingesting of this, basically the sugar narrative. I, that's what I was thinking is that we've been ingesting for you know 500 years, like a, a, a narrative that's not just about slavery, but is also about America. It's about the Americas. It's about the transition from uh, Europe to you know the colonization of the Americas and the opening up of you know that trade in trafficking in African and indigenous bodies to produce this this particular um, product that is global in its scope and it's so desirable and so um, unquestioningly uh, a part of our lives. I don't try to be a populist artist, but I think that there's an element that's just kind of like, oh, the Sphinx. Like I was just like, oh, like what is a big thing that people want to see? You know, <laughs> you know, what is a, a wonder of the world? Because I really thought, well, sugar is a wonder of the world. You know, there's nothing um, particularly natural about it. You know, how it comes into mm -hmm. being is a whole long process. Now, the central uh, work in that show, you know, an oversexed um, mammy in a, in a kerchief, um, you know, this, this, is a, this, is a, this is a trope that you, you, you have to kind of re-articulate in your work. And I always think there's a tension and a risk um, in, in reproducing any stereotype, um, even to critique them as you do. Uh, but you said that when you're accused of doing it for some kind of sensationalist or I guess populist effect that it reveals more about them let's call them the critics uh, than it does about the work itself well I think a lot of times in the act of critique not always but certainly with my you know my because I think my works are sort of big and histrionic in some ways it elicits mm. big and histrionic responses and so <laughs> <laughs> not always but certainly it's interesting in the early days to to see the ways in which um, the work was ascribed back to my body or um, mm. you know I was sort of spoken about in the terms that I had employed as a critique. Mm. Um, I think that interesting conversations can be had about what it means to be looking at these things or what it is to, you know, think about what is happening in one's own body when one's looking at uh, an artwork. Because I think that's a part of it is that there's something very physical in it, well, because the work is always, f for the most part, figurative, except for some text based pieces I have. There's a, a kind of a, a jarring, jittery quality, I think that um, is hard to discuss or explore with people because it is so intimate in the way you're asking. I'm, I'm entrusting something to a viewer that is maybe untoward in a way. Like, let's think about this thing. I actually don't want to think about it either, but let's think about this thing together. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's a reckoning here too in Australia with uh, the leg legacy of slavery. Uh, enabled by the racist mythology of white supremacy, you know, indigenous people who've been kept poor, farmed out for rations or low wages in the pastoral industries and domestic servitude, um, often until the 1960s. And South Sea Islanders were, were, were uh, imported and, and traded by private companies to slave in the cane, cane fields, uh, indentured for, to one employer for very minimal pay. Um, and as the embodiment of that history, I have to, I have to, I have to deal with it. We can't, we can't pretend these things don't exist because they leave scars. And if they're not scars, we're not, it's not as if I'm kind of performing my trauma every single day for someone else's, you know, to be observed by someone else. But it is something I can't walk away from. You know, the Martinican philosopher Edouard Gesson talks about this right to be opaque and to not be identified always as something or differentiated as other. I, mean, what do you, I don't know if you know anything about this song, but this idea that you should be unknowable and that you don't, you don't have to be someone else's projection. Yeah, it, it just touches on a particular kind of um, psychological state that I have been in, in 
recently, but also maybe for my whole life, which is um, along the lines of being uh, somewhat hard to read and then making uh. all of this, making all of these efforts, doing lots of writing, doing lots of art making, visual imagery to sort of help a read happen and then finding that again, I have muddied the waters completely and created another layer of opacity in, in, um, <laughs> uh, in that, in that ever present. And I think maybe that, that the, one of the problems of not just, um, you know, finding, um, safety and opacity is just like, there's so much of a, a culture of, of being open. <laughs> You know, I mean, being open and transparent mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. and um, that can be uh, somewhat debilitating as well. Being yeah, seen, totally. being seen, being known, <laughs> being, making oneself heard, making oneself understood mm -hmm. and then finding that, you know, mm -hmm. even in the course uh, of making myself understood, I find other complications that might need clarification but can't be clarified mm. and so you know it's mm. kind of like this interesting endless spiral of uh, uh, inept storytelling or something <laughs> I like this idea of just refusal I'm not playing the game and I think I've, I've, I've read parts you know parts of your you know, when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're kind of told you need to be something or do something you talk about the role model and fearing ever being, being someone's role model. And that kind of obligation, you know, that, 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 that uh, others project onto us if we, if we inhabit this space as people of, who aren't, people who aren't white, essentially. Um, that kind of responsibility, you know, is, is, I love it when, you, when I hear you kind of crack and go, I'm not doing that, I'm not playing that game. I'm, you know, this has got nothing to do with it. You don't, you don't know what my work's about. You're not reading me. I know. Well, it's very really, well it's very, very tricky. I, there's definitely a lot of um, school children learning about the artist Kara Walker. And so there's this kind of one entity over here, the role model who is mm -hmm. black and a woman and making something in, in the public sphere. And then there's, you know, a few X'd out versions of my work. There's <laughs> a few sort of blots, <laughs> a few sort of blots of black behind me that suggest <laughs> cut paper silhouettes. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's, you know, and then the reality is, you know, uh, the disclaimer at the front of my show saying, you know, sensitive ish, sensitive material, you know, consider whether you want to or whether you want your children to take a look at this work. And, um, you know, this is, I mean, I guess, yeah, to be opaque or to be uh, constantly changing. Mm. Or many things, to be many things at once. Now, when you imagine a viewer, do you think of a particular individual? There's someone, this is someone that, that, that can read the work, uh, who has to have certain kind of cultural information. Uh, or do you consciously make work, I guess, for, for other Americans? Or, 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 or for those people who have a share in what America came to be? I don't know. I mean, I think initially, maybe I had a, a very specific image in mind, and that was uh, uh, an image from a postcard from the 19th century of this little black girl with, a, you know, sort of nappy hair and a rags, and she's holding a big paper fan. And this was a something that was given to me um, when I still lived in Atlanta. And I still have that postcard on my wall, but it's a very... It's a very strange image to have on a postcard. It's a photograph. It says, mm. it has a message underneath. It says, some class, eh? And it's like mm. double entendre, you know, kind of, but also very kind of sexualized representation of this child who is actually an, also a real person who's unknown and unnamed and whose image sort of exists over, over a century. And I thought this is maybe for her, <laughs> mm. you know, I don't know. It, again, it's a little bit like looking into an image, the face of an image, the face of a, or, or the face of an object perhaps and, and um, projecting. I think that, that, that if there's an audience in mind, it has also changed and shifted over my period of, of working um, since I'm, getting up there in age um 
I do think with the public projects that I've done since 2014, there's a little bit of a more amorphous view of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, there's several tiers, let's say, of who may be looking at the work and it sort of includes a very frightening uh, mass of, of, you know, everybody who's on the internet. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because the, the work is photographable, public. shareable, and hashtagable, and mm. so all of that has sort of ch transpired in the last, you know, decade of my working, and that has changed. I think the way that I, not so much the way that I work or make my work, but it definitely changes the way I think the work might be seen once it's done. Were you surprised when uh, the National Gallery acquired these works? I mean, so as if you have had and had, had a long relationship with the gallery or with, with Australia even, were you a bit um, surprised? Oh, pleased for sure, yeah. And especially yeah. the four part um, drawing. Um, I'm glad that mm. found, found a, a good home. I feel like that's a, that's a funny one. Um, mm. Funny in a lot of ways, just an unusual drawing, um, sort of uh, a large piece that was both a drawing and a preparatory when I say preparatory, not for the final work, but definitely a part of my process of finding my way into what I'm thinking about. What's the idea? What are the ideas that I'm trying mm. to trying to work with? And um, so the um, the woman praying for uh, for some guidance was also me. <laughs> to some extent mm -hmm. praying for some guidance on how to get through how to get through a project and um so it needs a, a kind of a, a museum like home in some in some regards it, it does her good that's the work you're about to change from 2019 there's a figure yeah you're about to change a figure kind of there's, there's ship and then there's like she, it's, it's like she's landed somewhere. She's arrived. Well, I feel like she the is, ship is, is on. Is, I feel like the ship is about to arrive on her, on her doorstep. Uh, <laughs> I, I, to, I totally misread uh, it. Then. Well, that, I mean, that was my my reading of it. Was really like she's mm -hmm. she's saying, okay, um, what's happening here? What is this thing that's coming towards me? And they're like, your world is about yeah, to change. Yeah. And some yeah. of the spirits are like, hey, maybe you just see what they want, <laughs> which is of course the big um, nightmare of you know, the colonized people of the world. It's like, hey, let's, maybe they just want to <laughs> trade. They're just visiting. They're just visiting. They'll just, leave. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll be on their way soon. Um, yeah. So. I, I love these kind of moments of, of, of contact. In fact, I've just written a play myself about this moment of contact between my ancestors and the, um, uh, the, uh, the ship that uh, passed, passed the coast. Of Australia, um, they, we go back to these moments, and they, they they inspire us, and they make us think about um, who we are, why we're here, and I think these are questions that we deeply ex explore because we have you know this, they're, they're they're part of us. I keep going back to this, but I'm I'm just really interested in we don't have the freedom and the luxury of kind of just making art for the for its for its own sake I'm and, trying, I'm trying. and talking about things. Yeah. yeah, I know, I know. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, we're not there quite yet in, in, in global history. But do you do you kind of long for a time where you you are free to create works of the imagination that aren't tethered to to a past? Uh, yeah, sometimes I try it, but it doesn't feel it doesn't feel right. I can't say it doesn't feel authentic, or it feels like I'm avoiding something, or I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. So it's a little bit like, yeah, I could, I could do it, but why, you know? I mean, I, mm. so once you know something, it's hard to uh, to not know it. But there, you know, again, there's ways to find um, moments of of maybe beauty or, or, you know, little unexpected twists that don't mm. add anything particular to the historical or the political, but are simply there as a part of a piece to be felt, enjoyed, seen, you know, for their own sake, a little, a little flower, you know, a cotton ball that doesn't have to look like that, you know, <laughs> a nipple, you know. Well, Cara, it's been an absolute pleasure to to kind of explore the work with you. Thank Is there you. anything that you feel like I haven't 
I haven't asked. Oh, you ask so many good things. Kind of, I'm like, whew. I, I just really love your work and I love this irony and the sense of play and this idea that we don't have to be serious all the time and that we're not, we're not embodying trauma every single and performing trauma for other people. It gives, your work gives me a sense of freedom. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. And Project 2, Cara Walker, is on display at the National Gallery of Australia until the 5th of February, 2023.